Hello and welcome. My name is Roni Firon, and this is The Bigger Picture, where we sit down with experts to hear about their journeys, their insights, and the big ideas that drive them. Stay tuned for today's episode. In today's episode, I spoke with Professor James Pennebaker, a social psychology professor from UT Austin. Needless to say, within the psychology community, Pennebaker is a well-known name. James is a pioneer in the field of writing therapy, where he has explored how writing about a past drama can help people recover, as well as how the language we use can indicate the state of our mental health. He then went on to explore how people use language differently. For instance, how personality and gender can affect the language we use. One of the surprising things that emerged from James's research is that the biggest differences between people's use of language are actually to be found in their use of pronouns, those little words that no one quite pays attention to. Interestingly enough, it's precisely the way we use pronouns that can tell us a lot about who we are. So now, without further ado, I hope you enjoy today's conversation with Professor James Pennebaker. So I've gotten the chance to speak to all sorts of different individuals on this podcast, people from all sorts of different fields. But today's conversation is especially interesting for me because among the many things that you've studied, one of the areas that you've explored has been the meeting place between personality and language, which is a topic that I'm particularly interested in. So it's great to get to sit down with you today and talk about this field. Now, you've explored how all sorts of elements affect language use, such as gender, socioeconomic status, leadership styles, how depressed someone is can be reflected in language, how deceptive someone is being. But before we get into all of these differences in language, I would love to hear about the evolution of this research. Because if I understand correctly, this all started from a focus on how expressive writing can help people heal from traumatic events. And that this expressive writing not only was able to help people feel better, but also showed immunologic benefits. So can you tell us how you stumbled on this field of expressive writing? Okay. And it was stumbling. A little bit of background. I'm a social psychologist. I went to graduate school. I was interested in social dynamics. And I became fascinated with the mind-body problem and who gets sick and why. And Early in my career, I was focusing a lot on physical symptoms. How do you know how you feel? How do you know you have a headache? How do you know you're tense? And the questions are a little more complicated than I had ever imagined. In any case, I'd done many, many studies, and it was doing my first book. And it was toward the end of the book, and I was thinking, you know, I need to find out, are there certain personality types who report lots of symptoms or maybe life experiences? So I came up with working with students, a questionnaire to ask people everything we could imagine. One of the questions we put on the questionnaire was, prior to the age of 17, did you have a traumatic sexual experience? We passed this out to about 800 college students. And what we found was of the dozens, maybe hundreds of questions on that questionnaire, the sexual trauma one was more related to symptoms than anything I'd ever seen before. And about that same time, I was contacted by the magazine Psychology Today, which at the time was a really a major kind of new concept in a magazine, especially for psychology. And they were going to be doing a piece on my work on symptoms. And they were going to do a questionnaire in this issue and wanted to know if I'd like to add some questions. And I said, yeah, put that traumatic sexual question on, which they did. They got, I think, 24,000 responses. And this isn't a random sample by any by any means. But the average age of the people was about 38. And 22% of women and 11% of men reported having had a traumatic sexual experience prior to the age of 17. And those who had were more likely to have been diagnosed with cancer, high blood pressure, ulcers, colds, flus, everything we had. They were twice as likely to have been hospitalized for any cause in the previous year. Having that sexual trauma was really terrible for people's health. And I became fascinated by this. Was it something sexual? What was it? In later studies, I discovered it wasn't a traumatic sexual experience per se. It was having any major trauma that you kept secret. 
And it's this secrecy that was so toxic. And in the years afterwards, I started wondering, well, if keeping a secret is so bad, what if we brought people in the laboratory and had them in some way divulge it? And maybe through talking or maybe through writing. And talking was going to be too complicated. So I thought, well, you know, I'll just have people come in and write about a traumatic experience. Now, in this kind of research, it occurred to me, and you have to understand, I'm not a clinical psychologist, but this was just something that was so unbelievably interesting. It occurred to me if they, if we had people write about a traumatic experience, maybe they should write more than one. So I decided I was able to get a number of rooms. I was, I needed to run everybody in the same time period. And I calculated that if I had them write, say, four times, 15 minutes a time, I could run an entire, about 50 people in the span of about four or five hours working in a single week. And that's what I did. People were randomly assigned to at least two conditions. And in one condition, people wrote about the most traumatic experience of their lives, ideally one that they hadn't talked to other people about much. And the other half of the people were asked to write about superficial topics. And what we found was this writing had a profound effect on the people writing about traumas. And we had gotten permission from everyone to access their student health center records. These were all college students. And what we found was those who were in the trauma writing condition in the next several months ended up going to the student health center at about half the rate as people in our control conditions. And I was, I was really shocked by the power of this and also the effect it had on these students. I'd be walking on campus and people, a student would come up to me and they'd say, I was in your experiment a few months ago. I just want to tell you, thank you for letting me be in your experiment. And let me assure you, that had never happened in my life before. (laughs) In any case, so that's how I got into this expressive writing. Incredible. There's a really hopeful message here because we know how much trauma can affect our well-being and our physical health, you know, through the overactivation of the stress systems. But knowing that there's a way to undo those effects, the fact that expressive writing can have such a benefit is amazing. And I wanted to just be a bit precise here. And what exactly is expressive writing? Is it the same as journaling? Is it the same as talking to someone? What do you think is special about expressive writing? You know, all of these are overlap in some ways. To me, expressive writing ended up being a strategy of brief writing. In other words, When I hear about having to write a a journal or a diary, I just get depressed because (laughs) I would never be in an experiment where they said, we're going to teach you how to journal for the rest of your life. Jeez, I don't have that kind of time. (laughs) I'm not that introspective. For me, expressive writing is the kind of writing that you go in, you deal with an issue, and then you deal with it, and then you move on. And, you know, I had done this. I didn't know it was expressive writing earlier in my life. You know, I'd go through a period of uh, turmoil. I was married quite young. And uh, there were times that I didn't know what to do. I certainly wasn't going to go talk to anybody. And so I thought I'd just go in and write. And I found that to be liberating. And even now I write maybe once or twice a year, probably not more than that, when I am confused, disturbed, or upset about something. And I might just write once. But the point is, it's, it's kind of a life course correction, focusing on a particular problem and trying to understand it better. So that, to me, is what expressive writing is. And one thing that I also point out to people who want to do this is, there's not one true way of doing it. That what works for me might not work for you. And in my studies, I had people write four times, 15 minutes a time. But then I did some other studies and had them write three times and another time, five times, and sometimes 10 minutes, sometimes 20 minutes, sometimes 15 minutes. And it all seemed to work. And there have been multiple studies, actually been over a thousand studies on expressive writing done by people all over the world. And again, there's no one true way. And so some people think, well, you should write with your non-dominant hand (laughs) versus your, your dominant hand. You know, if Different it works, parts of the brain. Yeah, exactly. You know, try it. You know, it's free. It doesn't, it really doesn't matter. I, several years ago, discovered that I could have people write by just with their finger in the air. 
so they're not actually writing anything down. And people report that they find that sometimes more beneficial than writing on paper. It doesn't matter if you type. It doesn't matter if you write. Write what's best for you and see what works. I'm a researcher. I'm an experimentalist. And I encourage people to be their own scientists. Figure out what works. Right. There isn't some magic recipe for the type of writing that's going to help. I think there's something really profound here because there's something in writing that it's more than thinking and it allows you different dynamic also than talking to someone. There's an element of focused, organized thinking to writing where, you know, when we're thinking through a trauma, a lot of times it's just unhelpful rumination. But when you need to put pen to paper or even, you know, with your finger in the air, you're have to construct some sort of narrative around this and think about it from all sorts of angles and try to make sense of what happened. And I think that element is so important for working through any type of trauma because something traumatic happens. We had previous to that uh, narrative of our world, how we saw the world, and then the trauma happens and it completely destabilizes us, right? A lot of times We can't make sense of what happened, and it makes our past also incomprehensible, and we don't have a story for our future as well. So having to go through that writing, even briefly, helps us make sense of what happened. And I think there is an element of stress that it exists because something traumatic happened, and we need to figure out. How do we make sure that this doesn't happen again? So it's also being able to work through that kind of eliminates that constant anxiety. Yeah, I think you're capturing the process beautifully. I think that one of the key issues here is having an experience, a traumatic experience, and not putting it into words, not talking about it, is a real stressor because the mind isn't capable, generally, of putting together a really complex event because a major upheaval, it messes with every part of your life. It messes with your social relationships, your financial life, your eating, your sleeping, everything. And I think the real feature that makes such a difference is translating the experience into words. And writing is great, but also I think talking into a tape recorder will work or talking to a tree. But the <laughs> point with all of this is that. You are working through things on your own. That's why I think a conversation, it can work, talking to a therapist, talking to a friend, but there's always this social risk. What if they really don't approve of what you did? What if they feel hurt by what you're saying? This is where I think writing yourself or talking out loud to yourself is far superior to almost any other method. Absolutely. And I think the point you mentioned, the fact that keeping these secrets is so toxic, there is an element of needing to spit the poison out. And when you're talking to someone, it's, you know, you're trying maybe to censor what you're saying, or you're very uncomfortable in sharing everything. And there's something to the fact that when you keep things down, they manifest in all sorts of physical ailments. I think that's what you found in your research, where people who had the traumatic event, but kept it all bottled down, those emotions and those unprocessed experiences manifest on the physical level. The body and the mind are very much connected. I think you're absolutely right. I think your metaphor is one I'm not sure I completely agree with. You know, there's this metaphor that by not talking about it, all these things are bubbling up inside. And then by talking about it, it explodes out. I think it's more that when we don't talk about it, We're not able to figure it out. So consequently, our mind is working at top speed, trying to understand how did this happen? How did this happen to me? What role did I have, et cetera? And it's too complex to understand. And what that, when we're in that state, we don't sleep well because our mind is continuing trying to figure it out. So it's not the, the bubbling up that's the problem. The problem is you're not moving forward in understanding it. Right. And, and once, you put it into words, you're able to find some degree of meaning, some kind of structure and order to it all. And once you do that, your mind is your mind now goes, huh, 
okay. Problem I don't, solved. Problem solved. Or at least now I don't have to think about it as much. Right. And so now you can sleep more. You have more working memory. You do better in school. And there have been many studies showing each of these features to it. So it's it's not the lid on the boiling pot. Yeah, it's not it's, a catharsis of just exactly. getting it all out. <laughs> That's yeah. right. That's right. <laughs> no, no, it's definitely working through the problem. Do you know Alain de Baton? He's a modern philosopher. He's written a lot of books, but he has this one quote where he says that insomnia is basically those tricky thoughts that you ignored throughout the day. That's, they, so, that's so perfect. It is. Right. And yeah. they come haunting yeah. you, you know, uh, during the night. So absolutely. Now, I wanted to ask from your research, you looked at these different writing samples and you found certain patterns of people who did benefit from the exercise and people who benefited less. So what kind of patterns did you see there? That just bugged the hell out of me. I didn't <laughs> see a pattern. So, you know, in the early studies, the first study, I, there were maybe 40 people in the study. The second st study, there were 50. And then I did another one that had more. But there's so much variability. And the way people write is just all over the map. And I didn't see any difference between men and women. I didn't see any difference between uh, personality questionnaires that I gave gave individuals. And then I, in reading the way they wrote, I couldn't figure it out. So I ended up getting a group of uh, graduate students, many who are in the clinical area, asking them to read these essays and to evaluate on their own, you know, to what degree was this person working through issues? To what degree did they have some kind of insight? To what degree were they expressing emotion? To what degree were they being honest with, with themselves and so forth? This process took forever because people in these studies had written four times, 15, 20 minutes a time. And so it took them a long time to read them. And they were really, really depressing essays. And what I found was this method was really good at depressing the judges. <laughs> and secondly, the judges didn't agree at all on any of these dimensions. It's like getting a group of people to review a bunch of books or poems, and one person likes one, another person really dislikes that same one. And many of the times, if this was an issue relevant to the person, they judged it completely differently than everybody else. That's what made me realize I needed another way. And I had taken a little computer science in, in college, and I thought, you know, a computer program could go through and analyze this text. And by doing that, I could at least get some objective markers of some of the features of what people are saying. So working with one of my students, uh, Martha Francis, we built a computer program called Linguistic Inquiry and Word Count, L-I-W-C, and we pronounce it Luke. And the Luke program initially went through and it calculated the percentage of words that were positive emotion words and anger words and sadness words, et cetera. And also cognitive words, cognitive words like insight words, words like understand, realize, know, meanings, words such as that, or causal words like because, cause, effect. And then as long as we were building the program, we had it do parts of speech. So pronouns, prepositions, articles, conjunctions, and so forth. And by the time we finished, there were 50 or 60 different dimensions of language. And the program worked really well. We could go in, analyze the text, and we could get kind of a, a thumbnail sketch of each of the essays. And then we started to look at, can we get a sense of who benefits by looking at these, these dimensions? And we started to see some patterns. Uh, perhaps the most important one were the cognitive words. I just assumed that the more that people expressed negative emotion, for example, the more they'd benefit. Not, yeah, that wasn't true at all. In fact, it found, we found a very weak effect. If they used a moderate number of negative emotion words, they benefited some, a little bit more than others. And the more they used positive emotion words, love, happy, et cetera, while writing about trauma, they were a little bit better off. But the real action was in the cognitive words. And the people who increased in their use of these cognitive words from the first day of writing to the last they were the ones who benefited the most. They were the ones that were putting a story together. They were working through a process. And if people use these cognitive words at comparable rates or they started high and dropped low, they weren't putting a story together often. 
And then we found some other things as well. And that is the more that people changed perspectives while they were writing, the more that they could talk about their own experiences and feelings and also how other people were thinking and why they were behaving. Those are the ones who benefited. People who wrote with the same perspective day after day just didn't benefit. So this text analysis strategy was kind of interesting because it was showing that this was a cognitive process, not just an emotional one, and that to benefit from writing, there has to be some growth. There has to be some change. Looking at the same thing in the same way day after day is essentially rumination, and it doesn't benefit people. Right. There's a basic idea that labeling our emotions can help us overcome our emotions. And from what I hear you saying, basically going through that cognitive process of trying to understand the event, which is so loaded with emotion and understanding what happened, why did it happen? How did I feel? And what were the motives of the other people involved? And going through all of that helps us process those emotions and overcome them. And there's a very interesting interplay here between the cognitive and the emotional, that they're not uh, divorced from one another. They very much need each other. That's right. And, and in many ways, you can almost think of emotions as a certain form of cognition. In other words, we have an emotion, but we're still interpreting and understanding it in a cognitive way. And a trauma is mixture of the cognitive and emotional. Right, right. And it's just organizing all of that, that whole storm to make sense of it. And there was one thing that you mentioned about the ratio of positive to negative words. Is it right that people who only used positive words also didn't benefit much? That there needed to be some That's right. recognition of the negative? That's right. Because we ended up, because our first study suggested a moderate number of negative emotions and, and more positive emotions, we did these studies where we had people come in and write about traumas and some we said, just focus on the positive and just use positive emotion words and just negative. And neither group benefited. And the reason is every traumatic experience has both, both negative, but also positive effects. And it's hard for people to write about a trauma without bringing in the entire experience. And that's what's so interesting about both traumatic experiences, but also positive experiences. The best things that happen to us also have some negative sides to them. I mean, that's what life is. And that's the, kind of the way the brain interprets things. Right. There's a positive and negative to everything that happens to us. And only focusing on one part of the picture is very destabilizing, really. That's right. So you continued on with the Luke program to explore different types of writing samples. So this was more of expressive writing to work through trauma, but you also started to analyze different types of texts, for instance, um, people's self-descriptions and things like that. What did you find there in terms of personality differences? Well, this is what was this funny twist. You know, here I had been studying physical symptoms and all of a sudden discovered that having a trauma not talking about it is bad for you, which led me to expressive writing. And then maybe five or 10 years later, all of a sudden I have this computer program and I'm finding that it's related to expressive writing, but I didn't know how language worked. There's a kind of an irony in that my training was in social psychology. I was not even remotely interested in clinical psychology. And I certainly wasn't interested in linguistics. <laughs> Those were two <laughs> topics. They're the two topics I avoided in graduate school. And here I am now, all these years later, and deeply immersed in both. So I had the computer program, and I had the computer program just as the internet came online. And I know it for you and others out there in the audience who are under the age of, say, 30 or 40, that we haven't always had computers. <laughs> <laughs> And, what a thought. <laughs> you know, it's kind of weird, isn't it? In any case, here in the United States, about 1994, 95, all of a sudden this, this company, America Online, started. And now all of a sudden people had internet and they had access to email and AOL had these chat groups. So from 
your home computer, you could call into a number and it would hook you up to the AOL network. And there were these chat groups. They were in a huge number. So you could go and talk with people from all over the world about, you know, this particular religion, this particular football team, this particular meeting people of your age group. I mean, everything. And it was for me, it was like being in a candy store because Mm -hmm. you could also download all of these chats while they were occurring. So I would every night, everybody in the family had gone to bed and I now was downloading just tons of these AOL chat groups. Then the next morning I go through, clean them up and analyze them using the Luke program. And some of the first things I did was to look at the difference between men and women. I had a stereotype of how men and women use language. And it turns out everybody has the same stereotype. Right. Across cultures, and the stereotypes are wrong. And when I first analyzed the data, I initially thought there was a problem with my program. I checked that and it wasn't. And then I just thought it was a fluke that I found it. I found that women use I words, I, me, and my, more than men. And Which I do. The opposite I, of what you think. Exactly. Can't possibly be true. You know, men are arrogant, self-important. <laughs> well, they are arrogant and self-important, but they don't use I words more. They use them less than women. And there were no differences in we words. And I thought for sure women, much being much more communal, would use we words more. Nope, there's no difference. And there's a, some reasons for that. Cognitive words. Because, cause, effect, understand, realize, I assume men would use cognitive words more. No, nope, women use, use them at much higher rates. And then there were some other things, articles and prepositions. I didn't know, but men use those words at much higher rates than women. And then emotion words, no difference. And then the only thing that came out the way I expected it were social words, references to other people, and women use those more. I ran other studies and found the same thing. And it blew me away. It made no sense. And so I just put that project on hold, hoping it would go away. <laughs> I, I came back to it maybe five or six years later. And sure enough, th- those original findings held up then, and they do today. But It also showed me that language works differently than I thought. So I words are not a reflection of arrogance, the reflection of self-focus, self-awareness, being aware of your internal state. And when I say that, then you think, well, yeah, of course women use I words more. (laughs) It's obvious. (laughs) Anybody would know that. And we words, the difference, the reason there's not women don't use them more is because there are two types of we's because I talk to my students about analyzing the data. I'll say, okay, guys, we need to analyze the data. And that doesn't mean I'm going to be doing it. It means you're going to be doing it. (laughs) Yeah, there's a sort of command there. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. Or this idea of um, articles and prepositions versus social factors. The fact that men and women are doing these two different things is because women are more interested in other human beings. And so they actually use more social words than men, and men generally are more interested in objects and things. Now, this isn't true across the board, but if you're interested in objects and things, you have to use articles and prepositions. And if you're interested in other people, you're going to use pronouns and social words. And if you're trying to understand things, because these cognitive words are words that you're using to try to understand something you don't know, it turns out humans. Trying to understand humans and human relationships is far more complex than understanding objects and things. And we never acknowledge this, but it's a lot easier to build a rocket and predict what's going to happen to it, a rocket science, we call it, than it is to know how the people on that spaceship are going to connect with each other and interact for days and weeks and months. The social features of life are far more complex and requires much more cognitive effort to understand. Right. There's a lot more talking through that you need to do when you're talking about a certain social event, something that happened. You want to perspective take as well. What did she think? What did he say? And all of these different elements, there's a lot more cognitive processing that needs to happen. Talking about people's motives, you know, why did they do what they did? That's right. It- as opposed to why does why can't my Adobe reader read my PDF forms <laughs> right now? 
I don't have to work it through that much. Right. There's, there's <laughs> probably a clear solution to it. That's right. So just troubleshoot, you know, <laughs> turn it off, turn it on. It usually, usually helps. That's right. And use lots of articles and prepositions. So this was the beginning. And what I was discovering, and I didn't realize it at the time, was the fact I was actually studying what are called function words. And, okay. And what are those? Yeah. And so function words, they exist in every language. These are the simplest, shortest, and most frequent words in a language. And they're essentially linguistic shortcuts. And so they are pronouns. I, me, you, he, she, they, words such as that. Or prepositions, two of, four. Articles, a, n, and the. Conjunctions, and, or, etc. Negations, no, not, never, and a few others. In English, there's only about 200 common function words. Now, here's the interesting statistic. The average human has a vocabulary of almost 100,000 words. These function words take up less than 1% of all of all the words we know. Nevertheless, they account for about 50 to 60% of all the words we use in everyday life that we hear. In other words, we are bombarded with these. And as I'm talking, you can't hear it. You have no idea if I'm using conjunctions at a high or low rate. You have no idea if I'm using articles at a high rate. And you sure don't know if I use I words at a high or low rate. Even though we are bombarded with these words, we can't hear them. They're processing the brain differently than all these other words. And all the other words are overwhelmingly nouns and regular verbs. So what's interesting is here are these short words that are processed outside of awareness that are very, very common, and they are ultimately social words. Social in the sense of they require social skills to understand and use. A good example is imagine you walk out your front door this morning and there's a note in front of your door. It's not right in front, but it's, you know, a few feet away. And you pick it up and it says, I'm not here. How's it going? I'll be back soon. Does that make sense? Well, on one level it does, but another level it makes no sense at all. You don't know who wrote it. I'm not here. I, who is I, am not here. That means when, when was it written? Here, does here mean this particular location or this paper just, uh, was it dropped by somebody? All of these are function words and they only have meaning between the speaker and the listener. In this case, the writer and the intended reader. And what's interesting about these is just by looking at that note, we get kind of a psychological sense of who that person is. That person clearly knew the, the intended audience reader reasonably well. It was a fairly personal note. You can tell that the person who wrote it is, is somebody who is, seems to be fairly upbeat and has certain kinds of ways of dealing with the world. The fact is, even this little tiny speech sample tells us something about the person. And what this means, what I hope you pick up from this is by going in and reading people's, say, emails or going in and analyzing what they say, we start to get a sense of who they are. We get into their heads in terms of how they are thinking about others and themselves, their topic, etc. And this is the magic of analyzing language that you really can start to see signs of deception. You really can see signs of depression and, and other psychological states through language use. There's this interesting thing here where the function words, as you said, they're maybe 1% of our language, but we use them so often in terms of the words we speak and the sentences we say. They're such a huge percentage. And we often, our ears prick to the content of a sentence, to the content words, where really what would be interesting, as you've found, is the style of speech. And that really comes across in these function words and how people construct a sentence, because you can say the same thing in so many different ways. And that's kind of where you catch people, right? That's where people show their personality, their state of mind, um, if they're lying to you or not. So in terms of for instance, people who are more depressed, what kind of function words did you see them use? 
So there's one that jumps out the most. Keep in mind what depression is. A person who is depressed is crushed with these feelings of depression and worthlessness. It's as though they, and if you talk to someone who's depressed, they, they use language that of burden, of pain, et cetera. Depression has often been thought of as a disease of self-focus. And what we find is people who are depressed use I words at higher rates than people who are not depressed. It's really intriguing looking at this. We've done studies in terms of people who we have them wear essentially tape recorders and or we analyze their emails. And when they're not depressed, because most depressions are may only last a few weeks or like at episodic, the most, yeah. episodic, right? In a depressive state, they're using I words more. When they're not depressed, they aren't because it's pulling them in. In fact, one of our very first studies, we looked at poets and the poetry of people who either committed suicide or who didn't. There's a, and poets, as you might know, have a really high suicide rate. Right. And I was expecting to see that suicidal poets would write more about death and misery and sadness. Turns out all poets write about kind of sadness and <laughs> misery. It's, that's part of the job yeah, description. The suffering of existence. <laughs> exactly. But the big difference is, is suicidal poets use I words more. In other words, their poetry was much more self-focused than the non-suicidal poets. So a poet who's writing about the misery of love and the misery of life, they often write about it almost looking at it from a more distant third-person perspective, whereas the person who is suicide-prone writes about it, and they are right in the middle of it. I wonder, beyond the self-focus element, I wonder if using more I words also reflects the fact that you're alone more often, that you're feeling lonely, that you're feeling separate from other people, and that use of the personal pronoun and the whole I language is a f- reflection not only of constant self-focus and introspection, but really this feeling of disconnection from friends, from family, from community, from connection in general, leaving the person dejected. I think there's definitely some truth to that. It's also a little bit circular because mm-hmm. if you're in that depressed state, you are focusing internally more and you're almost incapable of looking outside. Right. It is, even if you're around people, you're feeling disconnected. That's right. That's right. Do you think in terms of, if we know that, would we be able to predict from people's social media profiles, for instance, how depressed they are? Is that a possibility? It's it's interesting. There have been studies looking just at specifically at that. A group that was uh, at Microsoft Research Munmun Chaudhary and also uh, Eric Horvitz did some lovely studies looking at people who at some point on Twitter said that they had been diagnosed with depression in the past. And they may have looked at primarily bipolar depression. In any case, what they were able to do was to go and find when somebody first said that they had been de- diagnosed or, or were depressed, And then you go back in their Twitter feed two months before, and they saw signs of a depressive episode in the weeks and months beforehand through their use of language. So it was was predictive of changes. And we've actually found similar things looking at breakups. So when a, a relationship breakup occurs, we can go, this is with Reddit, we can go back into previous weeks and months and we see signs of an impending breakup starting three months before the breakup. Wow. And what do you find there? They're actually, some of these signals are the same as depression. Mm-hmm. An increasing use of I words, an increasing use of cognitive process words, kind of a working through. So words such as that. And increase in anxiety words. And how about anger words or, for instance, Second uh, pronouns. Um, like you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Accusatory. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so with Reddit, we are looking at their language where they are not talking about their relationship. So we're not looking at their relationship mm. Reddit. So here they, they're in gaming Reddits. They're in talking about cooking, you know, all these other issues. 
but you just see these little subtle signs. The spillover. Yes, yeah, yeah. That's incredible. That's incredible. And you've also used the Luke program to analyze different world leaders and different, uh, you know, famous political speeches and things like that. What have you found in terms of, for instance, election season, right? And you see certain candidates are better accepted. What kind of speaking style did you find there? So <laughs> a lot of this has been done with my, my former student, Kayla Jordan. And what's interesting about this is she analyzed the, the language of U.S. presidents going back to George Washington, but also other leaders around the world, and just tracking who are the people we are, uh, who we vote, vote for and who gets elected. And what we find is there's been this general shift over the last uh, 100 years. It started about, 19, about 1919, 1920, somewhere around there. And what happened was all of a sudden, we in the United States, we had been electing people who were very analytic and kind of psychologically detached in their language. They were not mm. very personal. But they also spoke with some degree of humility. They, they used tentative words. They weren't certain of what, they were, what would happen. And over time, we have been electing people who are more, less and less analytic in their thinking, um, simpler and using really simple and simpler language. And at the same time, a gradual increase in certainty. And of course, you see this, Trump's the perfect example. But yeah. ironically, Obama was the same. Both Trump and Obama used really simple language. And they both spoke with absolute certainty and authority. And Biden is doing the same thing. And uh, I dare say Netanyahu is similar. <laughs> and Putin, although, but all of the, it's a really interesting issue. And why are they being elected? Because we like people who speak simply and are certain, which is frankly, a horrifying problem because the world is unbelievably complex. And anyone who knows anything knows that somebody who speaks with absolute authority is a huckster. <laughs> Absolutely. There's, there's a, few, <laughs> a few elements here. On the one hand, there's the certainty element where the world is so complex and so uncertain, and we all have this basic need of security and making sense of the world around us. And there's this father figure, right, who is so certain and is so clear in his speaking style. And he's going to solve all the problems. And they're really simple to solve. And he has all the solutions. And there's this very basic part of us that really wants to believe that. And I think it's interesting that 100 years ago, we were more receptive to humility because in humility there's a connection with reality because you can't know everything you can't be 100% certain you might understand the problem and you might be proposing a certain solution but you never know if it's going to work there's always an element of being humble and recognizing your own ignorance right your potential for ignorance and i wonder what culturally happened to make us more receptive to the simple, certain language? I think this is a human frailty in general. Mm -hmm. in, in other words, it's true in business, and I suspect it's always been true to some degree in business and also in leadership. I think one reason that we found this pattern with um, starting in, in the early 1900s is it was also the beginning of the media. That was, yeah. that, that was telephones and newspapers started and, and radio. And the more that leaders now could speak directly to the people. And in the past, most of these countries were pretty much run by the very wealthy in, in terms of who could actually vote. They didn't have to suck up to the regular person. And they were dealing with people who were more like them. And that group weren't as easily bamboozled. Whereas now when, you're, when you have, this is an interesting, I think, commentary on democracy, where you do indeed have everybody voting, and it's true. There is something wonderfully appealing about someone who finally understands what the problem is. And therein is 
is the problem. I'd like to say it's the problem of the leaders. It's the problem of us. It's the problem of human beings. Right. The leaders that we see today are catering to this very basic primal need for certainty, for safety, security, and also for they allow us to outsource the problem elsewhere, right? We vote for them and they know how to figure everything out. And we're a lot less involved in a certain sense in politics today and how things are run, even though political debates are, you know, at an all time high. And I think also this angle of the media, we're so bombarded with information today where there was this hope that in the 90s when the internet became widespread that everyone will have all of the information and we're all going to be very well informed. But really, there's so much noise and misinformation that you can't make sense of reality. And we're seeing these silos where everyone kind of exists in their own little virtual world and they're getting their own information. So someone who's able to, through all of that, come in with a, with a solution and with confidence. That's right. That's, right. Uh, that's very, very appealing. Interesting. And in terms of right deception in political speeches, you guys found around the weapons of mass destruction, things like that, there were all sorts there've of- been some, There've been some really cool studies on yeah. that. Uh, Jeff Hancock and Dave Markowitz are two people who've done that, where you can go through and do these analyses of the various leaders talking about the weapons of mass destruction prior to our going into Iraq. And showing that their language was, in fact, deceptive. And what, what patterns are so, show re- so deception? So uh, we've done many, many studies where we had to do laboratory studies, where we induce people to lie or tell the truth. Hmm. And I words, again, feature prominently here that when people tell the truth, they are, they're more self-reflective. They use I words more. And then there's some other words that are associated with this as well. But that's the one that I find most interesting. And when people are lying, they are kind of psychologically trying to distance themselves from what they're saying. And they'll use all sorts of interesting techniques to remove themselves. So one project that I did uh, several years ago, this was a woman, Denise Huddle, who was really responsible for it. She was able to get the transcripts of trials of people who testified who were either found guilty they were all found guilty, but half the people were later exonerated because of DNA or other evidence. Mm. And we did these analyses looking at the, the people who, you know, analyzing their language when they were on the stand. And the people who were found guilty were also later found guilty of uh, perjury, of lying in, right. lying in addition to the murder or whatever the, it was. It was usually a capital offense. What was interesting was the people who w- it was later found, we later found out they were telling the truth, they were much more likely to say, I didn't do it. <laughs> uh-huh. I mean, whoa. And it was really quite surprising. The people who were found guilty and were guilty were much less likely to say, I didn't do it. They would use other language. They wouldn't use I words. They would try to put the blame. Like passive on. language. Yes. Like it's exactly. not, not I, the active agent. That's right. That's oh, right. wow. Oh, wow. Incredible. <laughs> you, would, you wouldn't think that you think that people would just say I didn't do it and, yeah. and move yeah. from there. Incredible. Incredible. I wonder in terms of you guys are finding all of these different correlations in these different fields. I wonder if we could get to a level of precision where we could use this as a lie detection test. So I work with various agencies and sometimes attorneys. And here's the interesting issue. Language as a lie detector, it does pretty well. It can probably, in control studies, it can identify the guilty a person lying 65% of the time where 50% is chance. Now, If you expect lie detectors to be 100% accurate, it sounds pretty horrible. Right. But the reality is humans who read these same texts or even watch watch them being done if they've been videotaped will get between 52 and at best 57% accuracy. So it, it does much better than humans. Eyewitness testimony 
is notoriously terrible, and it might be, say, 57 to 60 percent accurate. That's allowed in court, even skin conductance and polygraph evidence. Polygraph is also probably about 65 percent accurate, maybe as high as 70 percent, but nothing's much better than that. And it tells me that what courts should be doing is getting every kind of evidence you can and presenting it and say, okay, this one is 57% accurate. This one is generally 65%. This one is 70% and so forth. You, the jury, have to not take any of these completely seriously, but look at the entire picture in making some decision. Right. Actually having the percentages and the numbers behind all of these different methods, how much weight you should be giving to each piece of evidence. Interesting. And in terms of self-deception, did you find that when people deceive themselves, they're not using lying words because they believe in what they... Um, generally, self-deception, there's much less good work on that. Mm. Most evidence suggests when people are self-deceptive, they use deception language. Really? Which is, I find, just fascinating. So they're, on some level they're aware of some kind of discrepancies with what they're saying. Yeah, there's like a splitting of personalities because we're made up of all of these sub-personalities pulling us in all sorts of directions. And part of us, even if we're trying to bullshit ourselves to a certain extent, part of us is always aware of that. That's right. It, it, it reminds me of a situation years ago. I had a couple of people in my lab and... Uh, the guy was had been jilted by another member of the lab in a relationship, mm. and this person was just full of rage about her. And I said, you know, I, I was asking why he was this way because it was disrupting the lab. Mm. And, and I think I may have said, if I didn't, someone else told him what I said, was that he sounds like he was still in love with her. How dare you say that? <laughs> She's the last person I care about and so forth. And then, of course, two weeks later, they were back together. <laughs> but it's that same issue of someone who's self-deceptive, they go out of their way to distance themselves and they're highly defensive. And they, in, in a defensive state, you do not use I words. Interesting. Interesting. I wonder, did you find any correlations with specific personality traits like the big five? This has been one of the most interesting features of this because I'm a social and personality psychologist and in the field of personality is really now dominated by the big five. And it's important to appreciate the big five is a self-report. In other words, it's, it's a, a, an excellent way to get people's self-theories. Who do you think you are? And we all hold these views, you know, generally, you know, I'm a worthy person, I am a this, I'm that, and so forth. And these are, these are educated guesses of who we are. But the reality is, is our self-theories often don't match our behaviors. I am a good person. Oh, yeah, yes, I, I did steal some money from this place, but that, that's not <laughs> me. <laughs> in other words, we all, we hold these theories, and these theories are really consistent, and they're consistent over time. They have beautiful psychometrics. But what I find interesting is they're not related closely to language. And one could argue, well, wow, this shows the problem of language. Or you could say, wow, this shows the problems of self-report. One of the areas I'm particularly interested in right now is authenticity. Okay. Authenticity is a really hot topic. And the reality is people agree on who's authentic and who isn't. And so a good example is if you look at uh, both Biden and Trump, voters saw both of them as authentic. In fact, when Trump won the first time, that was the thing that people said the most was he was authentic. Well, generally, authentic means honest. But nobody would accuse Trump of being particularly honest. Right. But he's still viewed as authentic. And what's so intriguing about this is authenticity is, is judged very well by other people. And by using Luke, we can do it. We do an outstanding job at, at identifying people's how authentic they are based on human judges. 
But people's self-reports of how authentic they are are completely unrelated to how other people view you as authentic. Interesting. And so we find that self-reports of authenticity are unrelated to language authenticity and unrelated to judges' self-reports. But judges' reports and self-reported judges' reports and language measures are really closely aligned. And what language patterns are you finding with people who are judged as authentic? Again, I words. I words. People who are authentic tend to use I words at a much higher rate. And they tend to be use uh, negative emotion words a little bit more. They swear more. <laughs> they are they are coming across as not censoring themselves very yeah. much. Yeah. Yeah, I've been thinking about this quite a lot about this whole idea of authenticity and I think it's on a lot of people's minds today. And authenticity really is being very honest about who you are, what you feel, what you think at any given moment. And I think people who aren't very authentic, they're really kind of betraying themselves from moment to moment. They're constantly, you know, assessing the situation and trying to think what kind of behavior or opinion should I have? What is expected of me? And the fact that you said that there's more, you know, I words on one hand, but more negative words, I think that's just, that's reality, right? We, we're going to have some good emotions here and there, and we're going to have some bad emotions. And owning up to that is, it just makes more sense. It's more realistic. And there's an element of our culture where we expect everybody to be happy all the time and everyone needs to have a good day. And there's just something very inauthentic that comes across. That's right. And there's an interesting irony to all of this. And that is one of our studies, we had people rate other people in terms of how authentic are they and how much would you trust this person? Mm -hmm. And they're not that, that highly correlated. In other words, okay. because an authentic person will say, yeah, I do. Sometimes I drink too much and, you know, you know I occasionally I start doing road rage and I feel really terrible about it. <laughs> and then you, you ask, well, how much would you trust this person in a job? And people will say, well, they're authentic. No, I would never hire them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because you know where you stand with these people. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to let them babysit your kids. Or <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> Something like that. It's authenticity isn't, it isn't the whole picture. Yeah. You know, it's one uh, ingredient that, you, that you're looking for. Incredible. I think this point about self-report measures is really important to kind of hone in on because people in general, we don't have a good understanding of ourselves. It's as much as we try, you know, to introspect, a lot of times people's perceptions of us are more accurate than how we see ourselves. And the fact that we're relying on all of these self-report measures is it's frustrating because you're trying to measure something but there's so much noise and there's so much differences and response styles and in the person's mood that day. And when you're trying to pick up on personality, there's something missing there. And I think your approach of using expressive writing or using you know, self-description or social media profiles and things like that and analyzing the language is using data that's, that's true behavioral data. It's a true reflection of the person's style. To me, that's where I think science should always be going is thinking about what is it that we're studying and how can we see it manifested in behavior and language is not the end-all measure by any means it has just as many problems as self-reports mm -hmm. but as scientists if we're trying to understand people we need to take advantage of anything we can you know we i hope in the years ahead we start relying more on you know, sensing data, for example, your Apple Watch or your Fitbit mm. or measures of trying to get a sense of people sleeping and drinking and, and socialization. All of these things that we know are related to life expectancy, to health, to, be, to parenting, to reliability, 
in work and life. There are all of these measures that we should be relying on. And no one measure is that good. It's really important to, for people to appreciate that. But we're in a position that we've never been in in the past to be able to start to track people. Now, that's kind of creepy. I, you, you've got to, you have to admit it is, it is creepy. But a lot of these measures we have control over, and we should have control if we don't. So we can start to understand ourselves better. And also, please give your data to psychologists like me so, <laughs> so I can understand people better as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I know that people are a bit concerned about, you know, being tracked and being measured in all of these different ways. But honestly, I think it's so exciting that we have access to all of this information and we have computational power today to be able to analyze it in a way that we've never had before. And there's a lot of promising elements to computer science and AI and machine learning meeting the world of social science and psychology. Uh, I think there's there's a lot of promise in that direction. I wanted to, for a few kind of closing questions, from what you found in your work with language, do you think we should take this knowledge and try to apply it in a way of you know changing the way we speak to reflect different things? Or is this something that we don't have too much control over? I don't think we have much control over it at all. It's interesting to study and to analyze yourself and using that as mm. a marker of who you are. But in the past, a thought experiment that I've always, always liked, one of the most uh, robust findings in language is leadership and I-word usage. That when mm -hmm. people are leaders, they use I-words at much lower rates. Partly because as a, if you're a leader, you start looking out at the people you're leading and you're paying attention to them and not to yourself. Yeah, you're oriented towards the group. That's exactly right. And what that means is you could imagine a study where I tell you and just, I say, okay, in a few minutes, I want you to, you're going to go and be part of this group. And while you're in there, I don't want you to use any I words. So spend the entire time, just do not use I words. Well, People can do that, but it doesn't make them a leader. In fact, they probably are less inclined to be involved. However, I could also say, okay, you're going to be in this group, and I want you to do what you can to try to become the leader of the group. And what you'll find is most people will end up becoming the leader, or at least probably the majority of times, and their I words will drop. In other words, the words follow the psychology of leadership as opposed to the other way around. And I think that's, it's really important to appreciate that just manipulating your words, right. that there's no way to do that. And where you can do it, but it won't work. Right, right. The words are a reflection of the thought processes that are happening. Interesting. And a more kind of zoomed out, broader question you know, looking at your career and the different research areas that you focused on, which were very unexpected. You know, you went into social science and you didn't expect to work in the field of clinical psychology at all, nor in linguistics. What advice would you give your 20-year-old self today? Keep up the good work. <laughs> <laughs> I have been very fortunate and I have followed issues and questions that looked really interesting. When I started out, I just assumed I'd go to law school, which gave me the freedom to, to major in anything I wanted. And I tried majoring in about everything. And then I, the last thing on earth I'd ever thought I'd go into was psychology, but I just ended up taking, reading a book on psychology. And I thought, man, this is exactly what I'm interested in. What book was that? It was an intro psych book. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, Crutchfield and Livson. It was a. <laughs> I was visiting my girlfriend, now wife, when she was spending the summer in Austin, and I went to the, the bookstore, and they were selling these books for practically free. And I thought, heck, I, I'll buy one. And it was a you know a very thick introductory psychology book. And I spent the rest of the summer reading it, and it would just. And I realized this is me. You know, it has all the things I'm interested in, and then. I never thought I'd go to graduate school, and I ended up going to graduate school. And then I never thought about getting an academic job. And, you know, if I got one, great. If I didn't, that'd be fine, too. Because I had worked 
some in some companies and so forth. And I knew that I'd be happy in business or a million different things. And then I did, in fact, get a job. And I was turned down for tenure early in my career. And I thought, well, hell, I can go work with the company because I now I have a much better sense of things. But I got another job in academia, and it's worked out great. But the idea is I've just followed what I've wanted to do. And it sometimes you get kicked in the butt. <laughs> but sometimes you don't and you can plan or not plan and you're still going to get kicked in the butt right. <laughs> sometimes and sometimes not. So I think, you know, part of it is just having a mindset of this is a really exciting, interesting world. It's unpredictable. And you look around and ask yourself, what is it I enjoy doing? What is it I'm good at? Uh, what can I do to at least eat? And then anything after that is is a bonus. Right, right. I think if you follow your interests, even when life kicks you a bit, which is inevitable, if you're following your interests, at least you're engaged with what you're doing. And there's that intrinsic reward of following, following that direction. I know um, you're involved in kind of reshaping the undergraduate program at UT Austin. What kind of things are you trying to change? Well, I should say that uh, I was part of a uh, initiative that started in 2016, and it became clear that the university wasn't interested in, okay. in modernizing American education. But some universities are, and the underlying idea is that our educational system needs to be modernized. Mm -hmm. And one is, and the irony is, one is taking greater advantage of technology, which COVID has helped us see that online education is a really smart system. It doesn't always work, but there are ways to completely rethink it that we should start from the ground up, which means not just having this traditional semester concept where classes are, you know, they go for 15 weeks, you meet three times a week. Why not have a class that uh, meets six times? Because you're just going to be learning about X. Why not uh, have courses that you can sign up for that start at any time? We are on a, using a model that was created, frankly, in the 1700s, 1600s, and was really codified in the early 1900s, and we haven't changed anything. And part of it is the universities have gotten sucked into a an economic system where they have to have you on campus because they built all these really fancy dorms. Mm -hmm. They built all of these classrooms, even though we don't need the classrooms. There's so many alternative ways of thinking about higher education. Interesting. There's so many incentives, economic incentives, you know, pulling the universities in these directions. But really, if we looked at education in the sense of what are the objectives? What skills do you want to learn? What is going to be effective for you in terms of the career you're pursuing? If we ask those questions, we would be able to create a whole education system that's so much more efficient and delivers better results and also doesn't leave people with student loans. Right. That's right. And it, there's another issue that very often people who are pushing for this more modern education system are ignoring is another aspect of universities is not just uh, training of students, but these are research factories Absolutely, where I've been able to thrive in this. And I can't tell you how deeply grateful I am to have been part of this system that I don't want a university just to be a teaching institution. It still needs to be a, a research institution because we are doing some of the basic research for disease, for psychology, for business, for all of these areas that is so important for a culture. Right. I think it's so important to be precise here in the kind of reforms we're looking for because we don't need to throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? It's not that universities are doomed and we need to get rid of them entirely. There are certain things that be, can become more efficient, but the fact that academia holds a place in society and that scholars have a place to work and to earn livelihood and have the chance to explore their interests and innovate and advance 
you know, the body of human knowledge, there's real value to that. And I think remembering what the goals are of academia and allowing a little bit of room for optimization and for for certain things to change, I think could really help these institutions evolve. I think so. Amazing. Thank you, James. This has been such a fascinating conversation. Thank you. I've enjoyed it quite a bit. For everyone out there listening, thank you for tuning in to The Bigger Picture. I hope you found this conversation interesting. You can find us on all podcasting platforms, wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure to hit subscribe to stay up to date with the latest episodes. My name is Roni Firon. This is The Bigger Picture. And thank you for listening. Till next time.